And we are up to chapter 17, which, as I said um, when we started it, is, is an absolute key chapter, really, to, uh, to understanding um, this particular book of the Bible. Uh, chapter 17 is the one, really, um, that's going to help you help you see you know what we've been leading up to really with with the various interpretations that we've had of um, the um, the beast and the woman who sits on or rides on the beast um, and so what I thought I'd do is just put this a little bit in context tonight we're going to be reading verses 14 to 18 um, but I thought I'd just read the verse verses 12 to 13 as well and just to kind of give it a bit of context so we'll read from verse 12 down to the last verse of chapter 17 and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the beast these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfil his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth so yes uh, so kind of building on the, the kind of imagery that I've used before that we've talked about that the beast represents the papacy uh, that the um, kings and their kingdoms even though some uh, it said uh, have received no kingdom yet that is at the time that John is being shown the vision in other words there's some here some kingdoms that you know some nations that haven't even been formed yet that John is seeing in this vision but they will be formed um, so um, what does it all mean well verse 14 uh, these these that is the kings and kingdoms that supported the beast supported the papacy shall make war with the lamb meaning not on the same side as the lamb of course is Christ but will make war against him uh, meaning they will come together with the papacy and they will oppose what we might call a biblical or even evangelical Christianity. So, so there's going to be this, this opposition to the truth. Uh, and the Lamb being Christ, the Lamb of God, uh, this is nothing less than, than the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, Antichrist means... Uh, not only the one who opposes Christ, but the one who replaces Christ. And um, an, an interesting number of verses I thought we'd look at that tie in with this idea of Antichrist, because it's spoken of very often when we talk about the book of Revelation, uh, is found in 1 John, First um, John chapter 2. If I skip a few verses um, in this section, it's not because they're problem verses for me or anything. It's just I'm trying to keep it relevant to what we're looking at tonight. Uh, but you can you can read through them, certainly. Uh, so 1 John 2 and, uh, and verse 18 it says, Little children, it is the last time. Just pause there for a minute. So uh, how many people will say, Oh, well, do you think we're in the last days? Do you think this is it? I believe we're in the last days. Well, John says we are. It's the same, the same phrase. Last time, last days. 
uh, like John says, uh, it is the last time. So when John is writing his first epistle, that's the last days. Um, there are other verses that, that confirm that as well, uh, such as verses in Jude. But, but anyway, uh, it is the last time. And as you have heard, the Antichrist shall come. Notice that as well. He doesn't say the Antichrist, but he says Antichrist uh, shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. Um, it's just interesting if you want to compare that with Hebrews chapter 1. And uh, verse 2, well, put it together, verse 1, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. So, yes, when the writer to the Hebrews was writing this, it was the last days, because he says, in these last days. Mm -hmm. So there is no doubt uh, that the last days begin when this New Testament was written. So first John 2, um, 18 that we read talks about Antichrist shall come. Uh, even now are there many Antichrists. And uh, if we look down at verse 21 uh, of John's uh, epistle here, it says... I have not written to you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. So, so he, is an, he is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. So he's come out and said it. He's the Antichrist. Or he is, an, not the Antichrist, but Antichrist. So William Tyndale, and I thought this was brilliant, in his book, um, The Parable of uh, the Wicked Mammon, actually says antichrist is a spirit not a person mm. uh, because that was the teaching of the catholic church there's going to be the antichrist he's going to come and but tyndale says no it's a spirit mm. and he likens it to the pharisees he says they come in the spirit of antichrist and that ties in perfectly well with what john says here who is the liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, he is Antichrist. So, so yes, they are. They come in, in the spirit of Antichrist. And Tyndale goes on to say, and he, of course, lived at the time of, of um, where the Catholic Church was at its most powerful. He says, the Pharisees, as it were, like in a play, go off stage, like their time's finished, but then what? What comes on next are the cardinals of the Catholic Church. And he's saying, same spirit, the spirit of Antichrist, they oppose Christ. They oppose and seek to take the place of Christ, just like the Pharisees did. Mm -hmm. So it's the same spirit uh, behind this. Because he that denies that Jesus is the Christ, that, that is, doesn't give him um, his, his proper place, his, his rightful place as, as the Christ, he is Antichrist. So, uh, now let's get into some historical facts here. Now, some nation, the, the fact that some nations supported the Pope and persecuted the true church whilst proclaiming themselves to be Christians or Christian nations is an undeniable historical fact. You know, anybody who can be bothered to research it will find that to be true. There were lots of countries in Europe that supported the Pope, that came under his authority, if you like, and that persecuted the true uh, church 
and, and, and anybody really who believed uh, the Bible. And we're not talking about one or two sort of small groups of people supporting the Pope. It says, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. But, and at the end there, of course, in, in verse uh, 18, it says that the woman which thou sawest is that great city, is Rome, according to my interpretation, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And you might think, the kings of the earth, but like this is like going on in Europe, like Northwest Europe mainly. So how come, how in what sense does the Pope reign over the whole earth? It doesn't seem to fit. Um, but if you think about it really, um, we have countries like, uh, when, the, when, the, when the Roman Catholic Church was at its highest power, but countries like Spain and Portugal, sending out missionaries, sending out explorers and adventurers and, you know, into South America, uh, into, uh, not less than the, the Crusades, you know, heading out to the Middle East. So like the, the Pope's reign, if you want to call it that, his power is felt not just in Europe, but in other continents, you know, it's spanning the globe, really, uh, 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 or, you know, where people are living at that particular uh, time. So I would argue that actually his reach uh, really is um, over the kings of the earth or certainly of the, over the, you know, the known world at that, at that time. Um, so the authority and with the authority, the doctrines of the Church of Rome went far and wide. You know, they took them with them. And uh, and the great hall that chapter 17 speaking of, uh, of course, is the Roman Catholic Church, and in a sense, Rome itself, riding the beast, riding the papacy that is supported by European nations. And then there's a kind of parallel here between, between Christ's crucifixion, because whilst it was the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Herodians who were opposing Christ and opposing what he was teaching and saying, the kind of muscle, if you like, was the Roman Empire, wasn't it? It was the Roman authorities. They were the ones, really, who, who crucified him, even though it was um, uh, those, those Jewish leaders who were conspiring against him. They used that kind of Roman military might to get the job done that they wanted to do and in the same way uh, the Pope and the uh, the Roman Catholic Church are using sorry I don't want to go up my leg <laughs> spider spider shawl um, are using those nations they're using those countries to provide that military power and strength to um, to persecute the real church uh, but Christ, because, quoting verse 14, is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful, shall overcome them. Christ is going to overcome those nations that are supporting the Pope and is going to overcome the Pope himself, the beast, and is going to overcome the Roman Catholic Church and all that power that is, that is seated there in Rome because he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings and and so it was that actually one of the most momentous events in the history of the church happened the Reformation you know and this is this is some people like they don't like it you know you talk about I want to hear about history I want to hear about you know God and what he's doing not history well, God works in history. Read the Bible, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. You know, vast portions of the scriptures are actually history. Uh, so you've just got to get, get used to that fact that God works in, in history. And, and what happened was those nations that supported the Pope, that supported the Roman Catholic Church, such as the Netherlands, the Scandinavian countries, German countries... Uh, Germany wasn't actually formed at that time, but those kind of kind of kingdoms, if you like, and of course England itself, who is under 
the Pope's rule, because of the Reformation, because of that truth that was let out, you know, and because people began to get the Bible in their own language, it really was like a like a Bible revolution. What happened is those countries changed from what we might call Catholic countries to being Bible believing Protestant countries. Mm. And that's massively significant uh, uh, and, and Protestantism and that is Bible Christianity uh, gained a foothold in places like Austria and Switzerland and Belgium and, and, and many of these countries that had at times been supporters of the Pope and been Catholic countries now turned on the Pope and on Roman Catholicism. Why? Because they'd received the truth, because they'd received uh, the word of God. And so when we talk about uh, they will be um, they will be overcome by the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings by Christ. How are they overcome by him? Well, John calls Jesus the word, doesn't he? The word of God. Uh, and of course, Christ's teaching, his doctrine, this gospel is found in the Bible. It's in the word of God. And so once people got the Bible in their hands, then... The whole, it was a revolution. The whole of Europe was turned upside down, you know, and the, that affected the power of the Roman Catholic Church and the power of the Pope. Um, so, was it in verse 16 of Revelation 17? It says, And the ten horns which thou sawest on the beast, that is these, these kings and kingdoms, they shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So this ties in so well, because it's like, one, on, on the one hand, they support their own Catholic Church in the papacy, and then something happens where they turn against her and they devour her. Uh, and this happens. Uh, there's a thing called the dissolution of the monasteries. You know, Henry VIII orders all the gold, all the wealth that are in the monasteries to be basically taken out and, and given to the crown you know so it's like the wealth the uh, the money that the roman catholic church had the doctrinal power over people is well not totally broken but is massively compromised you know they're they're really um what would you call it plundered of their wealth and of their and of their power uh, you know, and that's that's a fact of, of history, really. Um, and uh, and it's put in a very vivid way. It says, and the nations that supported her shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And they did set fire to, you know, monasteries and so on. And uh, uh, priests were put out. And I'm not saying it's all good, but what I'm saying is, for me, it confirms this as... Um, let's say, a robust interpretation of Revelation chapter 17. It fits so well, you know. Um, and, uh, uh, and because it made such a difference in everybody's lives, you know, suddenly people had the word of God. Suddenly the gospel was released again, you know, having been held, as it were, in bondage by... Um, uh, because because Bibles were not allowed to be translated into the language of the ordinary people, you know, they were in 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 the West of Europe, it was like it was in um, Latin, it was impenetrable to most people, and through people like Martin Luther translating it into German, William Tyndale translating it into English, but other people like John Wycliffe, who were before Tyndale, giving just ordinary people like here's the word of God. Once you have access to the word of God, what a difference it makes. And, you know, we've probably found that as well. Once you start reading the Bible yourself and, you know, hearing the message of Jesus, it changes your life. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so for uh, whilst for a time these nations gave their kingdom to the beast, as it says, it was only until the words of God shall be fulfilled so here's 
Yeah, the words of God, the words of the gospel. Christ himself coming forth in the word um, into people. So who is the, this, the mother of all harlots? Well, it tells us it's that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So Rome, as far as I'm concerned, it reigned before. Then uh, under, under imperial Rome, reigned over the earth. Then it seemed to be defeated, but then it rose again. Uh, and you have, you know, not a lot of difference really between pagan Rome and papal Rome. You know, still same kind of power uh, um, on the earth. So what was her downfall, what was Rome's downfall? The gospel and the authority of God's word. And wherever that gospel goes forth, it's interesting. You hear a lot of ex-Catholics who become Christians say, you know, they say, well, what was it? It was this, it was the word of God. When I started to read it myself, I realized, you know, it's like my questions were answered. Or it's when someone preached the gospel to them and they realise it's by grace through faith that we're saved. And the, this, these are the, the great gospel truths, aren't they? And remember, just a little, just finishing off now, uh, how nicely this ties in with Revelation 2, verse 16. You remember when Jesus was warning the churches and uh, he warned about the wicked Nicolaitans and Jesus says, Repent or, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And Jeremiah said, well, what's the sword of Jesus' mouth? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And that's how Jesus fought and overcame mm. the beast and the woman, the great whore that rides the beast. Mm. Through the sword of his mouth, through the Word of God. Mm. Being sent out through his servants and through his scholars and through people who would, through real Christians, basically. Mm. And, and those who would do, well, it says, doesn't it, uh, that he, he will overcome them because he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him, chosen and faithful. So it's those who are faithful to God. Mm. You know, they'll have a part in that overcoming of the beast and the woman that rides the beast. They'll have a part in it because they're using that sword of the spirit, the sword that comes out of Christ's mouth, his own gospel, his own message.